I'd like to welcome everyone to um, today's um, professional uh, open professional learning series. This is the first of three sessions in your Imagine's open professional learning series, and this is actually being um, hosted in um, collaboration with the scholarship in online learning group. Although this is actually open for um, everyone to attend. Um, the, this first session is um, exploring the concept of open, what is open, um, uh, why is learning now open, what's, what sort of practices are open in the, in the higher education space and what, what sort of platforms are being used to support um, open education. We have three presenters today. Uh, Julie Lindsay, who is You Imagine's um, Open Pathways Design Leader. We have Professor Val Peachy, who is the Professor of um, Open Education at CSU, and Open Learning at CSU, sorry, and um, also the co-director of You Imagine. And we have Leanne White, who is part, she's the project um, design and management um, part of the team um, in the Open Pathways team. So it's lovely to have the team presenting um, today. We have a pre-reading um, for those people that may not have um, managed to uh, read the pre-reading, that's fine. I'll share the URL uh, in the chat for you, and you may like to follow it up as post reading. <laughs> I'd now like to hand over to Julie Lindsay. Julie is going to be starting the presentation today. Um, the presentation will go for around 30 minutes. We have each presenter presenting for about 10 minutes each, and then we will open for um, questions and some general discussion. And if there, anyone would like to raise any of the sorts of issues that are raised in the reading, that'd be great. Um, and I'm sure that our presenters may also have some questions that they would like to table to get some responses from people that, have, that are participating today. Okay, Julie, I'll hand over to you now to get the rolling. Thanks, Lynn. Welcome, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. I'm just, yes, okay. That's, I'm just getting used to this slide turning at the moment. Okay, so look, three parts to this presentation, myself first and then Val and Leanne, and we're looking at processes, practices, and open pathways. And just letting you know that each one of these sections, of course, could be a one-hour presentation in itself. So this is really like the cook's, the cook's tour or whatever you like to call it. So we're, I'm, particularly I seem to have a lot of slides lined up. I'm going to go fairly fairly quickly, but you will have access to these slides afterwards and you can go through at your own leisure and to the recording, of course, as well. So in terms of processes, can open be defined? Who are the thought leaders? Who is open and how are the things that I'm going to cover? I've got a few little cheat sheets down here. So if I look down, it's not that I'm not trying to look at you virtually. I'm just reading some of my cheat sheets here. So definition of open is, is a little problematic. Uh, and that's why, one of the reasons why we're running this series, to try and define in the terms of uh, what we're doing at CSU and generally uh, more locally and internationally what open is. And starting with open education. So this is really an umbrella term. I've got one definition up there. I could have put 10 de definitions that I found online. But it really covers, you know, open educational resources. It, co it covers access, open access, open educational practice. It covers um, a lot of different things that we're doing and some of which we're going to talk about today. But it's really the adoption of practices that uses and reuses uh, open resources and, and that encourages people to create resources and put them in the open. Definition for open educational resources then. Uh, now, this came from way back in 2001, if not earlier, but definitely the MIT Open Courseware Initiative, where they put 2,200 courses available for free online. Uh, that was one of the major catalysts for this whole collection now, whole um, 
pathway that we have for open educational resources. And I've got a, another definition up there as well. But also, um, research has shown that there are practical challenges to adoption of open educational resources within higher education. And I've just listed some of those up there, um, in particular copyright issues and limited staff knowledge of open educational practice. And just a, a reminder that our next session in September, we are focusing particularly on open educational practice. Open research, open data, a couple of things there of interest. Uh, US, Canada and UK, all data is avail available publicly uh, when it's funded, when it's publicly funded research. Uh, and just a heads up on a site there that you may or may not know of, Research Data Australia. But, you know, the point of open research, of course, as you would know that, you know, subjects such as climate change allows for larger data sets to be created and meta studies to be conducted. So improving the overall quality of the analysis. Open access publishing. Uh, this means academics publications made freely available. Now I've got green, gold and platinum up there. Just a quick review of what this means. So the so-called green route, route uh, means the author places the article on their own site or the institution's repository. The gold route, where the publisher charges a fee to make the article openly available. And the platinum route, where the journal operates for free. So there are different levels there. And then, of course, there's this, um, uh, well, open textbooks. David Wiley, who I'm going to mention, um, uh, does open textbooks and then we have um or talks about open textbooks please uh, sorry and then open flip martin weller has written about open flip and what his theory is or what he's encouraging is that reallocation of resources to the production of openly licensed resources rather than the purchase of copyrighted ones so this is a whole new economic model there this open flip idea um, open scholarship which is really this whole open educational practice. So I'm not going to say a lot here uh, because we are coming back to this, but it's the engagement with social media. There's um, academics creating public identities. There's this whole digital scholar. I've given some resources. There's a last slide here where we do have uh, resources that digital networked an open idea from Martin Weller and the digital scholar revisited just this year. He's written another piece revisiting, um, maybe it should be called the open, open scholarship or the open scholar. And of course, we're often asked about MOOCs. And I just want to try and clarify this once again, uh, in terms of what a MOOC is, what an open course is. And I love this little picture here because it's, um, I got it off Martin Weller's blog actually, but he's, it's not original to him, but just to give some citation there. Uh, but MOOCs started in 2008 with uh, George Siemens uh, running, um, and I've got another slide coming up with what that original MOOC that he ran. But basically MOOCs are free and accessible, they're online. Um, but just remember that they're not always developed with open and free resources, even though the course itself or the MOOC itself may be free. They usually have a specific start and finish time. They're usually they're interactive, they encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning, of course. There's that whole C MOOC, there's the X MOOC, uh, which uh, is mentioned in that pre-reading as well. You might like to dip into that. Um, but then, on the other hand, we have what's called open courses. And this is more the focus of CSU. Now, Leanne's going to talk about that um, at, uh, in this session as well. But these open courses are developed with free and open resources, usually or often open all the time, so they don't have an opening and a shutting. Some will, of course, have a small cost, but they do have this sort of social interaction and constructivist approach. So who is leading open? I just want to go through, there's a, there's a whole list here. I just want to quickly run through some of these in more detail. But really, this is just the start of the list. Um, but just so you know, if you want to say, well, who can I read? Who can I, who's out there? Who are the thought leaders? Let's see. So we've got George Siemens, um, his connectivism and Connective Knowledge MOOC was the first really big MOOC. There's an article there uh, by Finney that you can read about that. Uh, he writes a lot about um, connectivism, of course, being and, and Stephen Downs, he's sort of his 
his uh, partner in crime there in terms of this theory of learning, this practice of learning as well. Curtis Bonk over there in Indiana, uh, he wrote the book The World is Open in 2009. So we're looking at, you know, theories and practices more, 10 and more years ago. Uh, he's also now written uh, MOOCs and Open Education. So Curtis is very prolific and very active in the open um, education area. David Wiley, he's with Lumen Learning and he is part of the Open Content Project or started it. Uh, he also writes and tweets uh, prolifically about open learning, open education. Martin Weller, who I've mentioned already, uh, Digital Scholar, The Battle for Open is another book that he's written uh, not so long ago as well. And look, I encourage you to, to dip into these people's blogs, follow them on Twitter, and just, you know, if you're interested, pick up what the, the conversation is and try and get some gender balance here. Not that it's all men, but um, there are significant women out there. And I just have time to raise one today. And this is Catherine Cronin over there in Ireland who recently completed her PhD thesis. And it's a wonderful thesis. I've read the whole thing. It's absolutely wonderful if you're interested in reading doctorate thesis. She also has some great articles as well, but she's particularly prolific as well. Um, also looking at who is open just somewhere to start exploring, or some places to start exploring. Quite a list there. A lot of um, interesting open approaches to being open, open courses, open opportunities for education and learning. Some of them you may know, some may be new to you. And to finish up, who is open in Australia? And this is not a, a definitive list by any means, but some of those who are popping up are USQ, Open Universities Australia, of course, UTAS, I don't know if you've heard about their Understanding Dementia MOOC that started this year, 200,000 students, it's had a, a global success, it's been a global hit, and uh, they've got two parts to it, and they're opening this first part again in starting next February. The ANU coffee courses are freely available. That's a different form of open. They're, they're, it's like a blog, but they're, they're like little course, little pieces you can work on. The OEP SIG, Open Educational Practice SIG, um, has just been started this year, linked with Ascolite, Adrian Stagg at USQ, and Karina Bos Bosu at UTAS. Uh, open, Ed's Pro open Ed Oz Project, that CSU was very involved with, um, uh, closed now, but the material is all online, particularly the case study themes. And that's it from me. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Julie. Oh, I see David. Hi, David. Nice to see you online. Um, and thank you, Julie, and thank you, Lynn. So it's a pleasure to be here today, and as Julie mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about the practices from a very high 40,000-foot perspective. It's funny, when she said that um, MOOC started in Canada with George Siemens, that's very true, and I'm from Canada, and quite familiar with the open context in North America. But you know, it, what's really interesting is that MOOCs, per se, they might have started there, but the last time I checked, they weren't a huge, they weren't being produced, let's say, like they are in um, the U.S. or um, even in Australia. So it's kind of an, inter it, they're, they're very open, but they're open in other ways, not necessarily through the design and development of MOOCs. Anyway, just moving on to my next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the context, the global community. And what I wanted to do here was just sort of give you a very brief and not inclusive by any means um, overview of a bit of a timeline, like how did we get to where we are today? And it was rooted in the UN Declaration of Human Rights way back in 1948, and there were two articles in, in that uh, document with, that referred to access um, to information through any type of media. Sorry, the, yeah, the access to information through any type of media, as well as the right to, uh, the universal right to education. 
So as you can see, there have been several initiatives. One that isn't on here was the um, 2007 Cape Town Open Education Declaration, where that um, at that symposium, they called on governments worldwide, and Judy, Julie alluded to this a little bit earlier, to um, openly license publicly funded educational materials for public use. So if you develop them with taxpayers' money or publicly funded money, they called on uh, countries around the world to open them for public use. The other um, events of note were the first OER Congress that took place in Paris in 2012, and they created the uh, OER Declaration. And in that declaration, that led to, um, in 2015, through the UN, the UN and UNESCO, um, putting it into the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. And particularly, they called it SDG number four, Sustainable Development Goal number four, which you can see up there what it was. It was, you know, inclusive and equitable quality of education and promotion of lifelong learning and opportunities for all. Now, after 2015, there was a period of research into um, the action plan as a result of that, and in 27, which led to 2017, the Congress in Slovenia, and the, I'm not sure if this is correct pronunciation, and if someone else knows how to pronounce it, I'd love to get your, your input on this. I think it's Jubileana OER Action Plan. And the people that had some input into that was a group in out of Norway, the ICDE, which many of you may be familiar with, and um, as um, at CSU, I was asked to represent Australia to sit on that committee around OER policy and practice because we're trying to elevate the visibility of this movement. Um, so that's sort of a quick peek at where we are at the moment. Looking at the supports, which is our next slide here. I'll just wait, Julie's got, Julie's in control of the slides. So let's, looking at, you know, what kind of supports we had, and this was alluded to uh, a little bit um, earlier, very briefly, you know, that there's a number of factors that you have to, to look at, and I've said strategic alignment, and you want to think about where does this uh, practice movement Etc. fit with your broader institutional goals. What's the philosophical position of the organization? You know, looking at the impacts of open on access, quality, the social justice perspective. So you need to have those things lining up. And, you know, is it being supported on a broader scale by local, regional, national funding? With because without that, you're not going to get extremely far, and sort of the strategies that are in place or that you have to develop to build the open culture like, what kinds of communication systems do you have in place? What kinds of reward and recognition systems might be there? The educational systems, the marketing and communication plans that are going to support this overall development. And um, then you can look also at what's the impacts of the, this movement, this philosophy on uh, economic development and growth in the countries that it's quite prevalent in, especially if you're looking at uh, countries in Africa or, say, less privileged countries where access is really vital and um, for countries to improve their economic standing. 
So as with anything, there are opportunities, but there are also challenges. And if we look at some of the challenges in this space, thank you, Julie, we can see the challenges around profit or nonprofit. I mean, some of the big publishing companies, I mean, they're beholden to their shareholders. So, of course, they're going to be less amiable to opening things up, although there have been really recently, um, it's David Wiley, of course, is, is really supportive of the open, but there's another publisher who is also doing a fair amount in the open space as well, but they're all looking for business models that will keep them viable. Um, I'm just not sure who that publishing house was. It came across on, on one of the documents or emails that flew across my desk recently. Um, the social justice and access perspective also comes into play because that can really drastically reduce students' cost of an education. And for those of you that might be interested in hearing more about this, in November, the Open Education uh, Resource University, Universitas is doing, um, we're doing a panel presentation from Port Macquarie that's going to be live streamed. And one of the panelists is um, a woman named Brenda Thompson from uh, Thompson Rivers University. No, the university was not named after her, but she is going to be doing a presentation on a program called ZedCred. And it was um, a program that TRU initiated that um, students in their first year pay nothing for their textbooks. They're all open and electronic. Um, so I guess the other uh, point that I've got on there is around, um, you know, society's focus. Should it be on intellectual copyright or should it be looking at, it's more of a question, should we be looking at it as social capital for the greater good? You know, there's a huge sort of discussion, I guess, around, around there. I mean, I don't know, but when we work in the open, it does raise the question, what is our, you know, intellectual capital? And I guess lastly is the issue around quality. You know, is it a case of user beware? Maybe, because when things are out in the open, there is nobody, you know, necessarily monitoring the, the quality. However, the beauty of that is that they can, you know, under the Creative Commons license, you can repurpose, reuse, reorganize with the right kind of attribution. So there's, there's definitely some pluses in there. And I guess the other, uh, the last part is the opportunities. And um, so I guess these are some of the features is around the opportunities. There's lots of different platforms, and, and Julie mentioned a lot of those. Um, there's the Creative Commons access through, um, which allows you to publish and repurpose, and different types of licenses too. So Carol, you're probably very much aware of those being working in the library. Um, some of the opportunities, access is for everyone, easy enrollment to, to these uh, subjects, you know, your email, maybe your country and your address and your name. Um, there's many opportunities to get your students in, especially around um, some of the ones that are affiliated with edX and Coursera that have strong marketing backgrounds. And when things go on the platform, though, one of the things that you have to think of is the, the different kinds of business models, because you can't just automatically put your hand up and say, oh, we want to be on edX. I mean, you might get on edX if you can pay $500,000 and your institution is quite, um, has been permitted to be on edX. So some of the platforms are much more, they aren't really, you know, open to put your subjects up. They might be open to the participants, but other platforms are much more open. And CSU, of course, is on open learning. And we also have access to Blackboard Open. So the other thing about the platforms that's quite good 
is that um, the, they usually have a lot of infrastructure and technical support so they can, you know, take money in different currencies, they can issue badges, they can award credentials on behalf of the institution with the appropriate um, parameters in place. So there are lots of opportunities with the Open and of course I'm an ardent supporter of it. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Leanne who will tell us a little bit more about some of the pathways. Thank you, Val. Uh, part three of this session will be looking specifically at open pathways at CSU and the platforms that we use in the development of our open courses. So, the You Imagine Open Pathways initiative includes the development of short, freely available online courses or mini modules that will articulate into fee paying single subjects and courses. Um, whether that be postgraduate, undergraduate level, or university preparation and continuing professional development. So a TASTER is an online course which is usually designed to be completed as an independent self-paced introduction to a subject or study area. The TASTER courses contain a limited number of topics, providing learners with a taste of what it would be like to pursue further study and or work in that particular area. At CSU, our Open Pathways courses are being developed on the OEIU, Open Learning and or the Blackboard Open platforms as Val and Julie have talked about already. So I'd like to introduce you now to each of these platforms, starting with the OEIU. So the OEIU is a global group of tertiary educations that work together to make tertiary content freely available and it connects learners around the world with defined pathways to education created by recognised institutions and assessed by global institutions and educators. So the Australian partners in, the, in OEIU are UTAS, University of Canberra, Curtin University and CSU. Um, OEIU courses can be assessed towards academic credit through one of the partner institutions, which means that for a fraction of the full tuition costs, students can get formal credit recognised from around the world. The learning is free, formal assessments are optional, and credentialing is very affordable. So at CSU, on our next slide, CSU has developed four Indigenous Australian micro courses and we're currently developing additional OEIU courses in ecotourism and leadership. I've just put a screenshot there of our landing page on the OERU site and the link there to our landing page if you're interested in more information um, on those. So a little bit now about our open learning platform. So open learning is an Australian company, it's cloud-based social online learning platform and it has a global reach, mainly targeting Australia and Asia, especially Malaysia. It has over 1 million users enrolled and over 300,000 from across Australia. It currently works with professional associations and educational providers in Australia, including TAFE, the University of New South Wales, UTAS and NISA. And their philosophy is based on the educational foundations of student empowerment, so to foster deeper learning through intrinsic motivation, authentic active learning experiences, just beyond going beyond publishing content, um, community and connectedness. So they encourage course activities that embrace connectedness and collaboration to build rapport between the students and to promote dialogue and exploration. With open learning, students are encouraged to reflect on their experiences, share and discuss real world ideas and connect with other students in a safe and positive learning space. Some of the features of the platform include the ability to create open or private courses and you can have free or paid courses. All public courses on open learning are reviewed based on their quality criteria and uh, courses that pass the review are listed in their open learning marketplace. Uh, 
the platform is constantly being updated and with improvements and help and support is available here in Australia. So we have found them excellent with the support that they have been uh, giving us uh, in the development of our courses. On the next slide, you will see our portal for the CSU Open on Open Learning. We currently have two live courses. That is um, Introduction to Ecotourism, which is an Open Pathways Taster, and Strive, which is a student leadership program, a private course for CSU students only, and that requires an access code to enrol. Julie, if you'd just like to click again, the, they will come up. We've also got two currently in development. Uh, get Ready, Get Set, Become a Digital Online Learner is being developed and will be facilitated by Julie. And I'm working on a short um, online course, Working with Offending Behaviour, Assessment, Treatment and Management with Phil Birch from the Centre for Criminal Justice. And the link to our portal is on that slide as well if you're interested, having a look. So Blackboard Open is the other platform that we have access to. So it's a cloud-based online learning platform. It has global reach, UK, USA, and also includes Australian institutions such as Bond University and Charles Darwin University, as well as University of Newcastle. The help and support we receive is US-based. It's mainly online, although there is an online community that we can access. Within Blackboard Open, there's no provision for paid courses at this stage or paid assessment through the platform and students um, self-enrol in the courses. But uh, it is very much like the Interact 2 interface and with the Blackboard build and functionality. So it includes tools such as learning modules, blogs, wikis, journals, discussion boards, tests, surveys and pools, all the things that we are familiar with here at CSU. So um, on the next slide, there's also just a screenshot of our um, landing page on Blackboard Open. As yet, we do not have an open course live on this platform. However, we will be developing new courses on the platform in the near future. Thank you. Thank you.